on campus, the version, there's a, there's a particular version of this question of who am I that I run into a lot. And that is this version. What do I do when the person other people think I am is actually not the person that I know myself to be? It happens a lot at Stanford. We call this the imposter syndrome, right? And campus ministers are also subject to the imposter syndrome. When I first arrived at Stanford, it was like, I have degrees, I'm really smart, you know? But inside, I felt really inadequate about, you know, could I do this job and how could I serve these people who are really, really smart? Um, so what do I do when the person other people think I am is not the person that I know myself to be? So what I want to do is just spend, you know, my time here just sharing with you some of the work that I've done in uh, on postmodern concepts of identity and who I am, and um, the theology of a guy named Athanasius, who's one of our early church fathers, and how Athanasius doctrine might speak into this imposter syndrome that so many of us suffer from. I can't hear you. <laughs> so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna start by looking at an example that makes me very happy. <laughs> this is data. Um, I am a Trekkie, uh, specifically I'm a next generation Trekkie, and data is my second favorite character in the next generation. Um, I think he's really cool because data, as you can see, is not human. He is an android. But even though he's an android, he chooses to aspire to being human. And so throughout the Next Generation narrative, we see Data trying to find his humanity. And so we see him try to whistle, and he can't. He never learns how to whistle. Um, we see him explore humor. Um, we see him do Shakespeare, and he gets a cat, in, in, you know, eventually in season four. And there's a wonderful episode, actually one of my favorites, where he actually creates his own android daughter. So he explores the concept of parenthood. And in another one of my favorite Data episodes, it's called Data's Day, Data sums up what he's trying to do for us. He says, if being human is not simply a matter of being born flesh and blood, if it is instead a way of thinking, acting, and feeling, then I am hopeful that I will one day discover my own humanity. Until then, I will continue learning changing, growing, and trying to become more than what I am. So what Data is doing in The Next Generation is addressing the who am I problem by testing out different ways of representing himself. He's testing out different aspects of humanity. And Stanford philosopher Ken Taylor, he, he calls this the human project. He says, human beings are the only creatures we know of that represent ourselves as having an ever unfolding life. So we see ourselves as creatures walking through an ever unfolding life and as we walk through this life, we are constantly faced with decisions to make about who we are, who we wish to be, and why we are making this choice. And so for Ken Taylor, he says life is a project and we have to determine who we are for ourselves. And Data is going along undertaking this project. Now, Data's journey is pretty optimistic. Um, he enjoys his explorations. We enjoy them with him. But what if our narration of ourselves, what if this journey ends up looking more like this? <laughs> I'm looking at Brad Pitt. Um, <laughs> Has, has anybody seen the movie Fight Club? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So in Fight Club, it's it's kind of curious. There's Edward Norton, who plays this main character. But actually, this guy is so faded, right, that he doesn't even have a name. We never learn his name. And he wants to be something other than his drab, boring self. And so his choices lead him to go to this fight club, where he's able to choose to be something that he's not. And we meet this other character played by Brad Pitt, but as the movie progresses, you realize that Edward Norton's longed for projected persona is actually Brad Pitt. 
you know, the, the, the projection, his hope for who he is, is so far removed from himself, it's actually played by another actor, and Brad Pitt's character does get a name. His name's Tyler. What happens when the person that other people think I am is not the person that I know myself to be? Or it's not the person that I want myself to be? What happens when there's a schism? Modernity addresses this who am I question in a very particular way. It says, the way we work out who we are is we decide. We choose. It's our choices who determine who we are. But is this true? Do we really have this kind of creative power? At the end of the day, Data is still an android. He does not become human. In the university, the notion of self is considered in a post-Christian manner. God is not allowed into the conversation. Um, and so, like, I like this quote by Alexander Pope. Know then thyself. Presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. We look to ourselves to decide who we are. But what I want to ask is the question, what happens if we bring God back into this picture? Does Christianity have anything to say? Does Christianity have anything to offer us in dealing with our imposter problem? Um, and to do that, I want to look at this guy. His name is Athanasius. Athanasius, he's one of my favorite theologians. He uh, was late 3rd century to early 4th century, and he's probably best known as one of the key players in Emperor Constantine's Council of Nicaea. And what was going on uh, in the Council of Nicaea was that there was this massive theological debate over the question of who is Jesus. And there were two sides. There was um, one side led by a guy named Arius, who said Jesus was a very good man and he was a great example. And so that's the, Jesus was human, fully human. Arius, uh, Athanasius comes along and he says no. He leads the other side of the charge, and he says, Jesus was human, but he was also fully God. And so Athanasius was a key person in um, laying out the Christian doctrine of the divinity of Christ and the, as, as the incarnation of God. Um, and his key work is called De Incarnation, on the Incarnation. Um, and that's, that's the work that I'm, that I'm drawing from. Um, so now to understand why Athanasius was so passionate about arguing that Jesus was fully God, we need to just kind of walk through um, some of his kind of doctrinal thinking. So, so here we go. This is what Athanasius said. The first thing Athanasius does is he starts with his doctrine of God. Who is God? And he said God is utterly transcendent. And he is beyond all being. But importantly, God is also, he's, he's uncreated. He depends upon himself for his existence. He doesn't rely upon anything else. Um, and so here's this transcendent God. But at the same time, God is good. And in his goodness, God the transcendent condescends to making himself known to his creation, and in particular, to humanity. We then move to Athanasius' doctrine of humanity, or his, his anthropology, what is man? And here, he gets fun. He talks about two ontological polarities of humanity. I love the word ontological. It means of our being. What are we in our being, okay? And what Athanasius said is, first of all, created beings are, uh, human beings are created. We're like, we're like every other type of creature. Um, and importantly, that means that in contrast to God who is uncreated, we are created. Athanasius insisted that if God is truly the all-powerful creator, he had to have created out of nothing. And in this regard, he disagreed with Plato. Um, and so the tendency of creation, because we were made out of nothing, there's a kind of a natural state. And that is that we have this tendency to fall back to nothingness. If we came from nothing, that's where we go back to. In other words, things die, things disintegrate. Um, and Athanasius uses the word corruption to explain this, this created state. That's our first ontological pole. 
But at the same time, our other poll is that we are the recipients of a special gift of God. God has made us in his image. This is the Christian doctrine of Imago Dei, Genesis 1.26. And what that means, Athanasius says, is that God, in his goodness and his love, and in his particular his special love for the human race, he has called us out of this formal, normal state of non-existence, this tendency we have to fall back to nothing. He's called us out of that into the life-giving presence of God himself. So in other words, God gives to us as human beings the capacity to enter into a relationship with him that enables us to stay in God's life-giving presence. And Athanasius talks about how we can participate in the life of God. We can remain in life. And so we are spared from falling back into nothingness, along with the rest of creation. Instead, human beings are given the ability to enjoy eternal blessedness, the gift of eternal life. And so our humanity is actually constituted by our unique relationship with God. We don't look to ourselves to work out our humanity. We need to look at who we are in God. What this means then for Athanasius is that when he talks about sin, sin is not a problem of what we do. Sin is a problem of who we are. Because what he says is when Adam and Eve fell, what they did was they turned away from the life-giving presence of God towards back towards corruption. So once we sever that relationship with the eternal life giver, we start to become undone. And so what we need what we need to be saved is we need to be created anew. So his image of salvation is the doctor is, is this image of new creation. Which means that Jesus, it's not enough that he was just a good man. It's not enough that he just forgives us forgives us for what we did wrong. He needs to have the power to recreate us and make us whole. And the only one, Athanasius says, who has the power to make us again is the God who made us the first time. So Jesus had to be fully divine. So what does this mean for this question of, of who am I? Athanasius says, I don't look to myself to work out who I am. I will not get a complete answer. Athanasius says, I am a being that is in relationship with God, and that is what makes me a human being. So how does this help us now? How does this help us address our imposter question? Athanasius says that if we try to define ourselves solely by our own choices, we will fail. Because we do not have the power that we think we have. We do not have the creative power to constitute ourselves as human beings. And so if we try, there are going to be mis things like our imposter syndrome, things like these mismatches between who we're trying to make ourselves to be and who we are who we actually are, these types of mismatches are going to happen. We're going to run into trouble. And I want to suggest that the solution that Athanasius offers us is found in the Christian practice of confession. When we're trapped in the imposter syndrome and we hide what is inside of us, we find ourselves hiding it often from ourselves even. And sometimes we find ourselves hiding ourselves from God as well. And the Christian practice of confession is that of bringing into God's presence our fears, our worries, our inadequacies. And really what we're doing then is we are inviting Christ, our creator, to redraw his image on us. Athanasius uses this beautiful image of, of a painter with a piece of wood, and he, he draws his portrait, on, a self-portrait on it. And then someone comes along and scratches it out, and mars it. And Athanasius says, you know, this painter, instead of throwing the whole picture out, even though it's just made of wood, he says, for the sake of the wood, the painter redraws the image and makes it new. 
So Athanasius says, if we bring that part of us that we are hiding to Christ, he won't throw us out. Instead, he will lovingly restore us, and he will make us whole. Athanasius is saying on a personal level, we need to come face to face with God to bring us bring coherence back to our broken sense of identity. Finally, I just want to make a suggestion about what this might mean for the university. Because as I said, in the university, in this conversation, this who am I in answering this who am I question, God is not allowed. And particularly, you know, I, I, I do theology. So a discipline like theology, which is come at from a confessional stance, a confessional faith position, we're not allowed to join in the conversation most of the time. Um, but what we're doing there is we are shutting out from our explorations a major discourse that has gone on for centuries. Um, for, and, and Christians for centuries have, I mean, Athanasius, fourth century, he has been looking at this question of who am I? And what we're doing in the secular university by closing out the faith stance disciplines is to say, we're not even going to let you into the conversation. And so what I want to know, what I want to ask is, where does that leave the university in its search for truth and for solutions to our big human dilemmas? What if Athanasius was right? And secondly, what questions are not being asked because a major perspective is being locked out of the conversation? So from my biased position as a Christian theologian, I want to suggest that disciplines such as Christian theology and the other confessional stance and theologies could enrich and sharpen our academic work and offer possibilities and perspectives that are currently not available in our search for the answer to the question, who am I?